The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 7 is going to use financial terms to talk about the balances of life and the values of life. He's writing uh, to a Gentile audience, but also a Jewish audience, and uh, he's going to speak to the heart of people in this passage when he speaks to them in terms of financial terms and athletic terms. And he's going to try to communicate to them that in relationship to life, you have to repudiate, you have to put behind you all of the things that deal with our sinful ways of life, our prideful ways of thinking that we're so good. You have to put those behind you, and you have to look to Jesus Christ and look to the goal that God has for each and every one of us for our lives. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. Paul says this, But whatever was to my profit... I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. If you remember uh, last week, we looked at the uh, prides of Paul. And he said, you know, if anyone should have confidence in the flesh that they are good enough for God, that they have done enough good works, good religious behavior, so on and so forth, I'm the one. If anybody should qualify on personal merit, I'm the one. And he went through... uh, from his birth until his uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ, all the things that he had done, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Israel, or of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, 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 from Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a zealot according to the law, blameless in, in law righteousness, and so on and so forth. But he says, you know, all of that 30 plus years of my life where I was trying to earn my righteousness, earn my salvation through personal and religious efforts. He says, I consider all of that to be a loss now. But whatever was to my account, whatever I had built up, he says, I now consider it a loss. The word for profit is a word for a financial gain. And the word for loss is a word that could mean a financial bankruptcy, to forfeit or to lose something. And so uh, he is certainly putting it into the terms that uh, we as uh, human beings could understand because we are so much focused on financial matters. Now, it says in the NIV, but whatever was to my profit, it says, I now consider loss. But I don't really think the word now there is appropriate. The reason is, is because in this particular use of this word, it is what we call a perfect tense. And it'd be better translated, I have considered this. I have considered this to be a financial bankruptcy. And when you use the perfect tense, you look back at something in the past that has been done away with, but that continues to have results today. And your emphasis is upon the results of today. The reason I say that is because in the next verse, he's going to use the same verb, but with the present tense, to emphasize that as he looks at the prides of life, the self-accomplishments, he says, I have put them away, and I will continue to put them away. And that's a constant, constant uh, work of the Christian life. Not only to look at the past and say, hey, I'm going to let that go, that is a financial forfeiture, that's bankruptcy, but I have to continue that attitude throughout life, or I could get caught back up into it. But whatever was to my profit, I have considered it loss. Loss, why? For the sake of Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ at Christmas, you've got nothing. Jesus said it this way, what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what will he give in exchange for his soul? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the one for whom we ought to be willing to give up all things in order to have him. But the truth of the matter is, we don't really have to give up anything to have Jesus Christ, except 
for our sinful pride. For once we become a believer in Jesus Christ, God can teach us how to properly use, control, and be good stewards over all the rest of life. In verse 8, he says, What is more? And this particular phrase is used really to correct a problem uh, or to say, on the contrary, in correction of the past, I consider everything a loss, a forfeiture, a, a financial bankruptcy, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. How the rich man had his barns filled and everything in life was good and he was totally secure. And that night his soul was required of him. And when he was in hell, he wanted Lazarus who was at his uh, table eating the scraps which usually only the dogs got. And uh, Lazarus in heaven and, and uh, he asks that someone be sent back to tell his family about this awful judgment. What good was it for him to have all the world and yet not have Jesus Christ? The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, not just to know him as Savior, and we do that by acknowledging that we're sinners and believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for my sins, he was buried, he rose again, and he's coming again someday, not just for the salvation that he provides, but much more than that, for the day-to-day -day help and living that he provides. What is more, I consider everything a loss to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. Now, Paul not only looked at his past and said, you know what? These things I count as financial bankruptcy. But Paul also lost much more. For in his day as a believer in Jesus Christ, and particularly a prominent Jew who turned to Christianity, the persecution that fell upon him was intense. And he lost and was ostracized, no doubt, by his family. People have a tendency to think the Apostle Paul was single, but he very well might have been married, probably was married, and maybe was widowed at this time. And uh, when he says he lost everything, I mean, Paul was from a very wealthy family of Tarsus. And uh, when he talks about send me the parchments and send me my cloak, he's talking about stuff that only wealthy people had. He didn't stunder, study under Gamaliel without some financial influence. I mean, that would be like going to, uh, well, what's some of the most expensive schools today? <laughs> and that and more, it would have cost his family. And so he says, you know, I count everything as loss. He goes on to say, I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. The word rubbish, scubala, was used of... Um, uh, the filth, rotten food underneath the table that had spoiled. It was used of human excrement. It was used of manure from animals. And when the Apostle Paul looks at his pride, and when he looks at his, uh, his uh, self-serving wealth, he looks at that and he says, you know what, this is nothing but a pile of manure in light of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. 1 Corinthians 4.13, he says it this way, we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to the very moment, we are considered the scum of the earth, the refuge of the world. The scum of the earth. This is a very um, uh, aromic, <laughs> picturesque word to those people of that day, and I, and I will describe it to you just because that's what Paul wanted them to know. As you know, they didn't have uh, toilets back then uh, and all the plumbing system. And so uh, those who had high, nice houses or whatever, they would have bowls. And they would just uh, use the bowl and put the lid over it. And then after it had dried and crusted, then they would have to go in and cast it out. 
and they would scrape it out and then dump it out the window or dump it out to the uh, street. That's the word for scum, the off-scouring of the world. I mean, I suppose to connect to it, we'd have to think back to the last time we had to go to an outhouse or a porta john. Now, the porta johns aren't as bad these days. I mean, you can get in and get out 45 seconds, hold your breath, and make it. But not those outhouses. I mean, those outhouses, when you get within 50 yards of them, you got to start holding your breath, right? And then, you know, I mean, you're just not going to make it. Not going to make it. But that's the imagery that the Apostle Paul is using to, to describe his prideful accomplishments and his sinful trust in the things of the world. He says, I consider them all rubbish, scubala, that I might gain Christ. And he wants to gain Christ in order that, verse 9, that he might be found in Christ. Found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. And that's what the Jewish people were doing in that day. And that's what Protestant people, and that's what Catholic people, and that's what Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Buddhists and, and uh, Muslims and everybody is doing today. They are trying to find a righteousness in their own code of laws. Not all Protestants and not all Catholics, but there's a whole lot of them that just aren't hearing the grace gospel that Paul talks about, that aren't hearing that, hey, you don't have to work for this thing. It's a, it's a gift of God. He says, I want to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, and it comes by faith, by trusting. How do you enter into a relationship with God? You enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by trusting him, by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. In Colossians 3.1, Paul says it this way, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the earthly things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's where the life of the believer belongs. Galatians 2.8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You receive the gift of God. God comes, dwells in your life. You are placed in his family. And then, through the power of God, you go about the good works of life, not to establish righteousness, but to establish worship and service to God. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Why does Paul want to know that power of his resurrection? Because it's the resurrection power that helps us to overcome sin. Overcome sin human weaknesses overcome the frailties of our life and to live righteously. Romans chapter 6, remember, if you have died with Christ, you have also been raised with Christ that you might walk in newness of life. Every morning I'm reminded, we all ought to be reminded as we get out of bed, see, I can sleep decently without getting into trouble. It's that time when I'm awake that gives me the biggest trouble. And I want to get up in the morning and I want to say, Jesus Christ, live your life out through me today. And that is wanting to know the power of his resurrection. That, that power that allows us to overcome the sinful attitudes and actions of the day. I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings or participation in his sufferings. And what does he mean by the sufferings? I, I, I think it's a broad term. I don't think it means persecution alone. 
It's used throughout the Gospels and in the New Testament to talk about the sufferings that come from temptations or the hardships that come from the trials and tragedies of life. It deals with physical challenges. It deals with emotional challenges. It deals with personal challenges. It deals with spiritual challenges. Jesus Christ is our high priest. He's our high priest, it says, because he was tempted in all ways, all kinds of ways, just like we are. And I don't know about you, but uh, for me, the, the Christian life, a lot of it's got to do with hardships and suffering or hard work and striving. This uh, wanting to be like Jesus Christ is a lifelong goal and project, isn't it? And, and it's difficult. Uh, and it's challenging. And uh, we fail at times. But it's all worth it to know Christ to gain Christ, and it is through these sufferings that we become like him. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, for instance. Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. In 2 Corinthians 3, 16... Paul says this. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil, this is the veil of blindness, the veil of ignorance, the veil of spiritual blindness, the veil is taken away. See, people are blind to God. They're blind to the need of the gospel in Jesus Christ until they focus on the gospel and they believe the good news. Verse 17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know, a person is really not free until they get to know Jesus Christ. I'm not saying they don't make choices, but they make choices within the bondage of their nature or their will, within the bondage of their depravity or sinful attitudes. Now where the Lord is, there is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Our life is a process of turning to the Spirit of the Lord. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10. Just over a page or so. 2 Corinthians 4.10 For we always, it says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. I, I'm constantly dying. I'm dying to John McClain so that I might live to Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul says, I've got to consider the past forgotten. I've got to consider my self-accomplishments like manure. And if I do that, I will know Christ. I will know the power of his resurrection. I will know the fellowship of his sufferings, and I will become like Jesus Christ, even in his death. And we saw in chapter 2 that uh, Paul emphasized that the death of Jesus Christ was a life of obedience to God the Father. And that's to be the life of the believer. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. So if we will put the past behind us, then we can move forward in the future. Look at verse 12 of chapter 3. He says, not that I have already obtained this, this, uh, this level of maturity, this level of complete holiness, or have already become perfect or fully mature, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
You remember in Acts chapter 9 in the Damascus Road experience, the apostle Paul, who was Saul at this time, is going around from church to church, city, or, uh, synagogue to synagogue, and maybe church to church, and city to city, and he is dragging people out, he is putting them in jail, some he is putting to death, and he is persecuting the church. And on the road to Damascus, he is struck down with a bright light, and this question is asked to him of Jesus Christ, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And at that point, he comes to understand that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He trusts the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he is saved, and he is seized onto by Jesus Christ. And what the Apostle Paul is saying in this verse is, I want to seize on to the reason for which Jesus Christ seized on to me. They're very strong verbs. I was seized. Why was I seized? And that's an important question for the believer's life. Why did God save me? What does God have for me to do in this life? Did God save me so I could be successful in my career? So that I could retire early and enjoy life and whatever? You know, that's a very personal question. Why has God saved you? I doubt that he has saved you just to be successful or just to retire early. God, it says, has good works which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. People get started too young serving the Lord, and they retire too soon from serving the Lord. Not that I have already obtained it, he says, or already have been made perfect, but I press on. And this is the terminology of a, of a runner pushing ahead. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, Paul doesn't understand. He hasn't grasped all that God has for him. But he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. The word forget, or word here means not just to forget, but to care nothing about. It doesn't mean that you mentally forget it, but that you, you don't count on it anymore, that you don't care about it. I don't care, he says, about what is behind. I'm going to forget about what's behind, and I'm going to strain forward to that which is ahead. Now, uh, my running career, my racing career, uh, ended fairly early in my teens. Uh, the reason it ended early in my teens was I found it very boring. Now, I know Steve loves it, and that's great, but personally, I found it boring. But I know that there are people who just love running. And the Apostle Paul uses a running term here. He, when he talks about grasping and attaining, or grasping, it's also the word to attain, to win the prize, to win the game, to win the honor and the medal. And when he talks about forgetting what's behind, the imagery is that of a runner who would be looking behind him constantly to see who's behind him. Now that slows you down, doesn't it? It's like when we were taught in the Little League, you know, when you hit the ball... Don't look and see where the ball is going. Don't see if the guy's caught the ball. You look at first base and you run as fast as you can to first base. If you start looking over, you're slowing down, aren't you? One of the basic rules of base running, something we hope the Tigers will learn. But you know, that's the way it is in the Christian experience. God wants us to focus on the base and forget about what's behind forgetting about what's behind, and then straining, reaching towards that which is ahead. And, and this is the picture of the runner or the athlete who's coming down that last 50 yards and they're leaning forward, and then, you know, they hit the tape. I know this isn't a very good imitation, but uh, you know how they stretch out there to hit that tape. And, and that's the imagery the Apostle Paul is using. He's, he's borrowing upon the athletic games of the day, and probably he's doing that because the people were very caught up into sports and things, just like today. You know, personal wealth and prosperity 
and sports are the big gods of Western culture. Verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, and they translate it heavenward in Christ Jesus. Really, quite literally, it's upward in Christ Jesus. The goal here was that was used, this word was used, of the victor's prize when uh, he had uh, run or accomplished a particular event with a special distinction. He was given a special reward. Not only was he given a special reward, but his name would be called out before all the people. And his father's name would be called out before all the people. And his country and city would be called out before all the people. I, I don't know why they have to give the dads the credit, other than maybe they were very involved in getting their uh, child started. But they wanted to honor the runner, the runner's father, the runner's country, and the runner's city. And so they would call them up to the platform, and they would announce this victory, and they would give them the prize. That is what Paul is saying to the people. In the athletic contests of life, which you folks are all so familiar with, he says, you know what? I press on like an athlete, but I have a different goal. My goal is the prize of God's call, God's upward call, God's heavenly call that is in Christ Jesus. You remember 1 Corinthians 9.24 where the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. The Apostle Paul is telling us, you know, just like the energy and the effort that we put into the athletics of life, we ought to put that into the pursuit of Jesus Christ and into pursuit of knowing him and living our lives for him. Now, uh, I have a kind of a special letter here this morning. Uh, it's uh, Mor Marty Morningwig uh, wrote, uh, wrote us a letter. You know who Marty Morningwig is? He's the one that gives us Morningwig sickness on Mondays, they say. Uh, but actually, it's not just to our church personally. It's to all churches generally. And, uh, and it says, uh, Dear parishioners, I'm concerned about our Detroit Lions season. The players are good. The coaches are great. We are putting in effort throughout the week, and yet we're still not winning. I wonder if God is punishing us because some of you are staying home and watching the game when you should be at services. If this is true of your life, please go to services so that we can win a few more ball games. Now, of course, that's a tongue-in-cheek, made-up letter. But it speaks to the heart of people at times. I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor, uh, and I, I can't remember if the lions were any better or any worse than today, but we lived right next door to the church, you know, and uh, I loved the lions. I was a codependent uh, little kid, uh, still about the Detroit Lions, lived and died with them. You know, every Thanksgiving day, my dad would take me as a little kid down to the Lions Stadium. I guess it was Briggs Stadium and then, you know, the Detroit uh, uh, Tiger Stadium. But we would go down there and freeze, usually. I'd wear everything I owned, and I'd still be cold. But we would watch the Detroit Lions and roar and root for them. And so, you know, as I was older, I, I just was so caught up in them. And so I would watch the game right until like one minute to six because they had evening services at this church. And then I'd run over there as quick as I could. And I wondered to myself, man, where are my priorities in life? When I am uh, so attached to something, and, of course, it's not just the lions. It's, it's all of life. Uh, I use it as an illustration to simply say this. What are you putting in the place of Christ? And is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? 
What are, we, what are we teaching our children about the core values of life? And are we teaching them uh, by our words and by our works to pursue Jesus Christ and Christ alone? For the prize of life is the fulfillment of the will of God in Christ Jesus, Paul says. We must forget about the things of the past. We must reach forward to the goals of the future so that we might fulfill the will of God in the present. Let me say that one more time. We must forget about the things of the past. Don't trust your religion. Don't trust your good works. Don't trust your life accomplishments for salvation. And don't, uh, don't trust them now for the future for they cannot protect you or insulate you from the future. Forget about the things of the past and stretch, reach forward to the goal of the future, and that is knowing God, knowing Christ Jesus, knowing his will for your life. And in doing that, then you will fulfill the will of God in the present. Again, in Jesus' own words, what good is it for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his own soul? Or what can he give in exchange for his soul? What we should desire to hear is what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 19. And that is when life is over and we enter into heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's joy and happiness. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. That is the goal of life. That brings everything else into perspective so that business and education and recreation and sports and possessions and everything else become tied in properly to the hub and the center of life, which is knowing Jesus Christ.